the Chick-fil-A Corporation. How many of you love Chick-fil-A? Oh, yes. And you probably know that the Kathy family that has been over it now for three generations, they are very sold out Christian people, very committed. And they have always had the practice that they honor the Sabbath and they honor the Lord with tithes. And so a way of doing that is they close their restaurants on Sunday. Um, you can't get a Chick-fil-A sandwich on Sunday. You can go somewhere else and get something different. But that has just been their practice. They decided this is how we want to honor the Lord by giving our workers the chance to go to church to worship or to go to rest, to just have a complete day off. And I just think that's so honorable. I don't know of too many restaurants that do that. Although, I was talking to our son Nick, you know that Nick and Taylor are in Italy, and he said in Cordenones, the restaurants seem to be open whenever they want to. He said, they'll just close without warning, they'll open, you know, at odd hours, so you just sort of go when the flow is happening, so um, that would be very different. But here's what I heard this last week, that um, Kentucky Fried Chicken averages $1 million per store per year. Taco Bell, $2.5 million per year. No, that's not correct, $1.5 million. Um, and they're in links with Pizza Hut and KFC and all of them together. Um, McDonald's is hovering between 2.8 to 3 million per store. Chick-fil-A, close to $4 million per store. And that's with being closed on Sundays. And all that to say that, uh, I'm not saying that if you, you know, open a business or something and you decide to close on Sunday, I'm not making any comparisons. Some of you may have a dream of opening a restaurant. I'm, I'm not making suggestions, but I am saying, if you put God first, he will take care of you. Isn't that awesome? So let's just give with generous hearts today. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to sow into your kingdom. It is amazing to us that we get to partner with you. But you don't need us. You've got everything. You made everything. You own everything. But still you let us participate with your kingdom. Bless, gift, and giver today, we pray. In the wonderful name of Jesus and all God's children say, Amen. Since He's called us out. Today the message is called, The Scope of Seasoned Servants. So far in this series, we've defined the church as the gathering of believers. The church is not a building, but a people. We defined it as an organism, more than an organization. It is the place where we gather for preaching, teaching, giving, and fellowship. And we also looked at the strong unity that is the church. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Paul says. It's one. We have looked at the fivefold ministry gifts. Uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Remember an ape? Who does PT? Yes. Yeah. Just try to forget that sermon. I dare you. Um, five different ministries. Five different ministers. Uh, the ministry gifts to the church. <laughs> the Bible says that I'm a gift to you. I think some of you sometimes wonder, okay, did this gift come with a gift receipt? Like, it can, can, if I want to return it and exchange it for something else. Um, many times in church life, the name of a denomination is telling you at an important clue. Uh, for instance, the Lutheran Church, Martin Luther. Uh, the Methodist Church, the methods of John Wesley, Charles Wesley, uh, George Whitfield. They practiced that their methods were holiness. And they 
decided to call them the Methodist Church. Um, Baptist, baptism is a very important part of the belief system of the Baptist Church. Shakers, they shake. Quakers, they quake. No, they do not quake. I'm just lying. Actually, I, but it was kind of funny. I thought, well, I'll just go with it. Quakers are actually, they don't quake. They are very quiet and uh, very respectful and practice silence and quiet. Basically, there's three different types of church polity, or you could use the word church government. Three different types. Um, the Bible uses words to describe um, churches this way, like, for instance, Episcopalian. Three different government styles. Presbyterian. Congregational. Those, those are the three basic ways that churches assemble themselves. Let's talk about each one for just a moment. Episcopalian, which is top-down government. It's uh, centralized power. Red tape, bureaucracy, everything has to be cleared through the authorities. Presbyterian, what it attempts to do is a little bit of both worlds. You have local leadership, you have national leadership. When you have a national conference, you try to have an equal number of lay leaders, equal numbers of ministers as voters. It's sort of the best of both worlds. Congregational, that's the entire other end of the spectrum which does not have any central government. All of the structure comes from the local level and nothing um, overarching from the top. So which are we? We're in Assemblies of God Church. Uh, which one are we? Well, actually, the Assemblies of God uses this phrase, cooperative fellowship. And it basically means we try to be a little bit of all three of those things. Um, we're a little bit congregational because the voice and the desires of the congregation are very important. The congregation elects its pastor. It elects its uh, uh, board of deacons. Uh, we call them board members. Um, but we're a little bit national because we have a, 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 a resourcing agency that helps and that provides accountability for all the ministers. And we're a little bit Presbyterian because we have... The Presbyterian Church has what's called sessions, that is board members, elderships. Well, we have a model of that, and we, and we have it at the local church and at the statewide level. And, and so we're a little bit of all three, cooperative fellowship, that's, that's the phrase. Now this morning, I want us to continue to define church leaders as we look at three Greek words from the New Testament. Um, I've spent a lot of my life studying the original languages of the Bible. When I'm speaking, I try, I try not to say Greek words or Hebrew words unless there's a reason. A lot of times you'll hear a pastor say, well, this Greek word means thus and such. But very seldom does any one word mean one thing. I mean, think about it. The word run for instance, has so many different meanings. My refrigerator runs, so does my car and my nose. I can run the table at the pool hall. I can run up a tab at the hardware store, but both of those are very different from when I run for office. I, if there's a run on the bank, your luck has run out because you have run out of money. You can run down your battery, you can run an engine hot, you can run down your friend, or you yourself can run down. You can run up a charge, you can run down a list, you can run in a store, you can run out of toilet paper, you can run underneath the coverage, you can run over the competition and run inside the baseline, or you can run around like a chicken with your head cut off. But if you run into a rattlesnake, you better run for your life. All I'm saying is that any word can mean so many different things. And so the only 
real way to define a word is by how it's used in its context, how it is used in it, it how it is housed, you know, where it sits, where it lives, and what's going on around it. But there are times that I think it really helps to say, here's the Greek word. And that's when there is what's called a cognate. A cognate is when it sounds the same in that language as it does in our language. It sounds similar to something that we know, and we can kind of relate to it because it translates so easily. That's when it's really helpful. So today, we'll look at three different New Testament Greek words as we're talking about leadership in the church. Episkopos, presbyteros, and diakonos. And each one of them sounds familiar to a word that we have heard before. Here's the first one. Episcopos. Episcopos. The bishop who oversees. This is one of the leaders of, of the church named in the Bible. You read this, this word a lot. Um, break it down. Epi is a preposition. It means over. Epi is over. Scopos is like scope, like a, a scope. Think of a sight on your rifle when you're looking very intentionally. Um, so, episcopos, episcopos means overseer, overseer. Someone who's looking over things and watching over things. That's the episcopos. When this word uh, was translated into Latin, it was called biscopos. So sometimes you hear the word bishop. It comes from that Latin word. So episcopos, it, it might be an overseer, it might be a superintendent, it, it might be called a bishop, but it's someone who looks intently, who watches over, and has a very specific assignment. Uh, yesterday, in the Aggies game. Um, by the way, how many of you are so glad that football has returned? Yes! <laughs> I am so happy. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm a serious Aggies fan, and so is Andy. And, and even though we won yesterday, we were so disappointed. We really feel like we're 0-2. We got our hearts shaped out by UCLA last Sunday night, and then yesterday we barely beat Nickel State. Nobody even knows who Nickel State is. <laughs> it's going to be a rough year. But, but we were watching the game, and number 21 for Nickel State, J.J. Smith, he tried to block an extra point. He, he jumped at the snap of the ball. Man, he got back there fast and he blocked the kick. And he was celebrating, but they threw a flag. They blow the whistle. They called offsides. You should have seen his reaction. Oh, I wasn't offside. Boy, he's storming around. Everybody in the stadium knew he was offsides. 105,000 people are watching. He's definitely offside. The replay shows he's all the way in the backfield before the ball was even snapped. He was offside. Sometimes you can really, really think that you're doing something right, but there was someone who was overseeing the game. There are these guys in black and white stripes with a whistle, and they're watching, and they're they're looking, and, and that's the way the episcopos is always. It's someone with authority to lead in ministry. It's usually translated overseer, or like I said, sometimes bishop, but it's a position of leadership with authority. And um, here's just an interesting observation, because the words that Paul and Peter and sometimes John used in the Bible about church leaders, some of them were not new words. They were borrowed words from current culture. They just took ideas like superintendents or people who were overseers, and they, they used them. And that was the case with this word. And so when this word goes uh, forward, um, AD 155, there's a church leader named Justin. And then in AD 200, another one named Tertullian. Don't you love these names? And, but they both referred to a Sunday gathering of worship, a meeting, 
and they talked about a person called the president. Now they didn't mean like the president of the United States, but, but already by the year 155 and by the year 200, there was a person called the president. And you can think of it this way. That was a person who presides over the service. If a, a presiding a president. I mean, you see what, what they were going for. There, there was no idea that we have in, in our American thinking of president. But the interesting thing, the only reason I mention it, the interesting thing is that the bishop or the, the overseer, the episcopos, was not necessarily at the church. The president was the one who presided over the services. That would be more like your local pastor. But So what was that bishop? Sometimes they were there. Sometimes they might be traveling in other places. So you get this idea, okay, this is someone who is overseeing a, a large area. Um, I want you to help me out on this. Before you put it on the screen, hold off just a second. Episcopal sounds like what? What, what church does that sound like? Oh, yeah, Episcopalian. Go ahead, Dylan. Episcopal sounds like Episcopalian. And the Episcopalian church has authority in its bishops. Um, you have to consult the office, the home office. One of the things that when I talk to an Episcopalian rector, they will tell me, man, stuff gets kind of stuck in red tape. There's lots of bureaucracy. Um, it, the, we have to get things cleared before we do it because it's very much top down. And that's just the design of it. Uh, the Episcopalian church is, uh, is not... Catholic, but they build themselves as we're Protestant, but we're also Catholic. I mean, they're the closest to Catholic that you could be without being being a Catholic church, and they build themselves that, that way. And um, that's not a slam or a judgment or anything. That's just the way the church is structured, the Episcopalian church. Now, um, just a little interesting thing that I discovered. When America was formed, the Baptists and the Methodists, their churches spread like wildfire. And they grew amazingly. And why do you think that is? Well, here's exactly the reason why. Because they did not have to go across the sea and get a bishop to sign off on something. No. The Baptists said, hey, let's go into a new town. Well, look over there. There's this old saloon that's abandoned. That would make a great church. They'd go in and they'd just clean it up and get a few people together. Well, you guys need to get yourself a pastor now. Anybody feel called to preach? Okay. Elect some elders. Okay, there you go. You're a church. And man, I mean, it spread like wildfire. The Methodists spread like wildfire because they had circuit-riding preachers. In fact, someone has said that John Wesley wrote over 8,000 sermons riding on horseback. How do you do that? I mean, he would preach multiple times a day, hundreds of times a year, and I, I don't know how he did it, and I suppose, and I mean, the only thing I can compare it, can compare it to, I think he must have been like texting and driving, riding sermons on the horseback. I mean, that's got to be what that's similar to. So... But just absolutely amazing. But, but because they didn't, they didn't have to go through procedure, then the church was able to spread and grow. Just an observation. Here's the second word this morning. Presbuteros. Presbuteros. The elder who is seasoned. Presbuteros means a mature man having seasoned judgment or experience or an elder. Um, some folks make a big deal out of the fact that the New Testament seems to specify elders are men. The feminine singular presbytera does not exist in the, in the Bible. But I don't put much stock in that. Um, that's just simply the way the language works. In a patriarchal society where men are dominant and women were not educated at the time, that's simply the way it was spoken. In fact, the truth is in the Greek language, if you wanted to talk about men and women, the way you would do it was just address the whole group as men. And it was understood to be for men and women. So I don't think we can really base it upon that. Uh, the truth is that Paul could have used the word man to describe the position. 
He could have said it this way, when a man aspires to be an overseer. But he chose instead a gender-inclusive way of saying it. Here's what he said. He said, whoever aspires to be an overseer. Now, we're going to read some scripture in just a moment, but important observation here. When Paul said, whoever aspires to be an overseer, there's two really important things about that. Number one, he could have said, if any man wants to be an overseer, but he didn't have a perfect opportunity, but he chose, if anyone wants to be an overseer. And then here's the second thing that's really important. It is not an office. It is a service. The calling to be an overseer is not intended to be a title, though it is a title. I'll be the first to tell you it's a title. We have all of these titles in God's church. But first and foremost, the one who's called to ministry is called to be in service. And so actually the King James Version is not correct in this case, where it says, if a man desires the office of a deacon, that's doing a little bit of manipulation to the original wording, which was actually, if anyone desires to be a servant. So, let's read some scripture for just a moment. It's 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 1 down through 7. It reads like this. It's the, let's look at the very text that we just talked about. Whoever aspires to be an overseer, that's the episcopos, desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must arrange his family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. Verse number five, if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So now here's what you need to know. In Scripture, almost, I would say, exclusively, the first two words that I told you about, episkopos and pres presbyteros, they are used interchangeably. There doesn't seem to be any sense in which we can figure out, well, there's, here's what's different about them. Maybe the slightest little variation. But both of them are overseers. They're people who've been assigned to lead and, and to lead in a respectful way. And that's what this is talking about. So, so the episkopos and the presbyteros is advanced in life, an elder, a senior, uh, think about this, among the Jewish people, at the time of Christ, the elders were the members of the Sanhedrin. Those are the ones that Jesus referred to as the elders, the members of, of the ruling body. Because in those times, uh, the rulers of the people, the judges were selected and, uh, um, from among the elderly men. Um, here's something interesting. R Revelation describes that there will be 24 members of, it seems like, a heavenly Sanhedrin, 24 elders who surround his throne. I'm not sure what to make of that other than just to say, just to say God always has perfect order. Always has perfect order. So um, you can read about that in the Bible. Now you help me out before it comes on the screen. Presbuteros sounds like what? Okay, go ahead, Dylan. Presbuteros sounds like Presbyterian. And now, both the... Um, it, by the way, the Presbyterian Church has authority that is both national and local. We talked about that. There's an equal number of ministers and lay le leaders representing. But now, both the Episcopos and the Presbyteros, they, these are... Lifetime ministers. These are like career-called people. Maybe they're full-time. Maybe they're bivocational. Maybe they're 
called to lead a church. Maybe they lead a region or even a nation. Um, they may be called a lot of different things. Bishop, overseer, superintendent, elder. And actually, there's a lot of overlap between these. Um, that they kind of blur together. I've been visiting with uh, Flo Poré about, um, about the upcoming memorial for, for Brother Anthony. Very interesting talking about uh, what is our sister organization, Church of God in Christ. Wonderful Pentecostal denomination. They use the terms bishop, um, elder, uh, Brother Anthony, First was um, a licensed minister, and then he became, and I believe I'm saying this right, um, I believe, I'll have to check my notes, I think he was termed a licensed bishop. But that, anyway, that may not be correct, but she was, Sister, Sister Flo is still today a licensed evangelist and went through the process of becoming a licensed evangelist. And the way that they would refer to her is unique. Remember last week I told you about the, the apostles and the evangelists, very similar in some ways to our what we call modern day missionaries. She would often be called uh, the, the missionary evangelist. So, um, but there's lots of different overlap, lots of different ways to use these words. But there is yet still one other term for the leaders in the Bible for us to consider. It's the word diakonos. The third one is diakonos. The leader who serves. Diakonos means one who serves in ministry. Or, or more generally, a servant. It's a word that means servant. So the word appears... 29 times in the New Testament, and of those 29 times, it's translated by the New American Standard Bible as deacon, three times, as minister, seven times, and as servant, 19 times. So, the best definition of the duties of this person that was called the diaconus is one who ministers to the church through their service. So, we were just reading in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We read the first seven verses. Let's read ne the next verse. Verse number 8 says this. In the same way, diakonos, deacons, are to be worthy of respect, sincere, and not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must, be, they must first be tested. And then, if there's nothing against them, let them serve. Let them serve as deacons. Diakonos, deacons. And, and so, a lot happens to different words through the centuries. Um, that word, deacon, the way we say it here in our local church is board member. That is the elected leadership. The, the board of directors. Same exact office. Servant leaders. Some churches might call them elders. You know, the people who serve on the eldership for the church. They're the leaders of that local church. But some churches, when they say elder, they're talking about a, a pastor, a, a teaching pastor. Some, when they say elder, they're talking about an, an entire region, someone who's over an entire region. But notice how Paul uses that same term in Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading Philippians 1 verses 1 and 2. It says this. And by the way, this is just the greeting that Paul gives to the church in Philippi. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers, the episcopos, and the deacons, the diaconos. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, taking all of what we're reading and considering 1 Timothy chapter 3, we read it earlier, it's fair to say that the word diaconos is talking about an important leadership role in the church 
but that it is a, a lesser role. That's probably not the right way to say it. It's a role that is accountable to the other two positions that we named. Uh, so you've got um, the, the overseer, call him the bishop, call him um, um, whatever of those names you want to call. The, those people serve, and then underneath them, deacons serve those offices. Uh, for example, Paul expected, the Apostle Paul, he expected that the determination of the ones who would serve as deacon would fall to the leaders of the church. You can read that in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, what we've just been reading. In fact, if we read on verses 1 all the way through 10, you would see that. Clearly suggests that the deacon answers to the other two. And uh, nevertheless, the deacons, as part of the leadership of the church, they express their leadership primarily through acts of service for the benefit of the entire congregation, including other leaders. The best example is the appointment of the deacons within the church at Acts chapter 6. Uh, Stephen was selected along with six other men appointed to be the primary leaders of that local church, hands-on involved. So diakonos sounds like deacon. You already see that. And the office of deacon, um, or you might, you might hear, like we say, board member, or some churches may say elders, is a position of servanthood. I, I want to state this. I have been so blessed at Buckeye First Assembly for 12 years. I cannot think of a single board member that has not been a servant. We've been so blessed. And I know pastors that that's not the case. And I just, I gotta tell you, it makes my job so much easier when people have a heart to serve and they just roll up their sleeves and, and behind the scenes they are working. Uh, in fact, in the book of Acts, several of the ones who were deacons, they eventually became evangelists themselves. You remember that? Stephen, uh, Philip, Philip had four daughters. All four of them were evangelists. And so, if you serve, huh, if you serve as a deacon or a board member, watch out, because God just may call you to to full time ministry. Well, I've seen that happen, and uh, it's very real. So, just to summarize, deacons are local leaders focused on service. And, and catch this who are given as a gift. Think about it. Last week, I told you that God gave five ministry gifts to the church, not this church, but to the church at large. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Um, all of us people, and there's, I'm not the only one here. We've got staff pastors. We've got credentialed ministers in our, our church. People who are called to lifetime ministry, that's a gift to the church. Now, I was kind of joking about it earlier, but, but it's, it's a gift. It's like a, God says, I'm going to bless the church and just give this gift to, to my church. But here's the amazing thing. Not only did God give a gift to his church, but God gave a gift to the gifts. And it's beautiful. God gave deacons as a gift to, to support their pastor, to embrace the vision, to stand with him. And that's why I am so thankful that we've been blessed beyond measure. Well, I don't remember ever leaving a board member, a, a board meeting with people angry at each other, with you know, people storming out of the room. In fact, sometimes, we finally have to just, okay, shoo out the door. We've been talking, we've been fellowship. We just love one another. And it is a blessing to be in that room, and it's a blessing to our church family at large. Um, I, I haven't answered a lot of questions with this message, and I didn't intend to, like, what's the relationship between the Episcopos and the Presbyteros? What are their roles? How exactly do they relate to the deacon, like how, how does that all pan out? I, I did 
If we had a lot of time, we could dig into other scriptures, but I did put them in your notes. If you've got this, the notes or if you're doing it uh, on you version, you can see it's in there. Acts chapter 20, verses 17 to 28. Also, Titus chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. But basically, scripture does not make a clear distinction between the elder and the overseer uh, in terms of their role of leadership. Those terms are people who are over churches. Some of them might be over a local church, or they might be over several churches, or over leaders. Um, but here's the deal. A New Testament church ought to be led by overseers, bishops who are older and more mature, elders who guard the flock, and then there is a second layer of leadership called deacons, who focus on serving the body. And churches may not get it exactly right. Our church may not get it exactly right. But I can tell you this, when we follow God's, God's design, it accomplishes a great amount of things through His, His, His work, through our structures, even in spite of us. God still blesses His church. Look at your neighbor and say, so what? So what, Keith? Here's so what. Trust the scope of the Lord's design. Trust the full breadth of His design. He didn't just throw it together haphazardly. He, he put this beautiful organism together living, breathing church. He, he gave order to it and design. And, and we can trust that He is behind the design of His church. I want to close by doing something so very specific God put upon my heart. And this is it. Um, I want to read a quote to you that's very, very powerful. And then I want to pray a prayer with you. And this is unusual for me, but it is a scripted prayer. It is a written prayer. The words of it are powerful. And uh, it, it's an adaptation from Hannah Whittall Smith, one of my absolute favorite writers. And I, I thought I could try, I could try to pray the way she prayed, but I can't pray better than what she just prayed. And I want us to pray it together. And then after we have done that, then there's a prayer team that's going to come to the front. Some worship music that's going to play. If you have any need in your life, anything at all, they want to pray with you. They want to be here to just meet you at the point of your need. So this first quote, listen to these powerful words. This is from Mother Teresa, uh, who served in India. And uh, this is a book of hers called A Gift for God. Let's go ahead and put that up there. Put yourself completely under the influence of Jesus. So that he may think his thoughts in your mind. Do His work through your hands. For you will be all powerful with Him to strengthen you. And then I want you to pray a prayer with me. The Christian's Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whittall Smith. And I don't want you to say these words out loud. And I know that it may be awkward for you to pray with your eyes open, but I'd like you to keep your eyes on the screen because I want you to feel the impact of these words as I'm speaking out loud and you are silent, but we're praying together. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are able and willing to deliver me from all the care and unrest and bondage of my Christian life. I believe you did die to set me free. Not only in the future, 
but here and now. I believe you are stronger than sin and that you can keep me, even me, in my extreme of weakness from falling into its snares or yielding obedience to its commands. And Lord, I am going to trust you to keep me. I have tried keeping myself and have failed and failed most grievously. I am absolutely helpless. So now I will trust you. I give myself to you. I keep no reserves. Body, soul, and spirit. I present myself to you as a piece of clay to be fashioned into anything your love and your wisdom will choose. And now I am yours. I believe you accept what I present to you. I believe that this poor, weak, foolish heart has been taken possession of by you. And that you have even at this very moment begun to work in me to will and to do your good pleasure. I trust you completely. I trust you now. As you were praying that, it's possible that there's individuals in this room who you could not really pray that in all honesty because you know that you're not walking in relationship with Jesus. If you need to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, when the prayer team comes in just a moment, all you have to do is just go to one of them and say, I want to know Jesus as my Lord. Help me to know how to pray. They would love to help you. If you need healing in your body, if you need wisdom about a decision you're going to make, if, if the relationships on the job are just so stressful right now, no matter what your need is, God cares for you so much and He will meet you at the point of your need today. And so I want the music to go ahead and play and the prayer team to come. And please, please come if you'd like prayer today.